Well, I'd like you to turn back to the passage which I read just a few moments ago, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10. If you've been a Christian for a while, you will probably be very familiar with this passage. It is a wonderful passage that speaks of God's work in us as sinners, that transforming work which uh, takes place in our lives through the hearing of the gospel that points us to Jesus Christ and faith in him. One of the great dominating words in this passage is the word grace. That's a word that perhaps you're familiar with. It's a precious word and it's very much part of the Christian vocabulary. Many people today, grace is a word they simply restrict to maybe a little prayer before you have a meal. It's a good thing to do, isn't it? It's a right thing to do. But the Bible speaks about grace in much more elevated terms. Remember some years ago being in a shop and seeing a poster and it was an unusual shop. It was just uh, knickknacks and things like that. And there was this poster and on the poster it said, grace is more than saying a prayer before eating. And I thought, well, that's fair enough. So I bought the poster and it's there in our utility room, I think, right now at the moment anyway. But it's a reminder that when the Bible speaks about grace, when Christians sing about grace, and when we think about grace, we're thinking about something that is profound and deep and glorious. So just for a short time tonight, I'd like us to dig into this uh, very well-known passage to remind ourselves again of just how wonderful God is in terms of his works and his ways towards us as sinners. Now, you probably are aware, I'm sure, that there are many hymns and songs that focus on this word grace. Here's one. It's not very well known, but it's, uh, the language is a bit old-fashioned, but it certainly makes the point. It's a hymn by a man called Philip Doddridge. Grace, he writes in this hymn, tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear. Grace first contrived the way to save rebellious man and all the steps that grace display which drew the wondrous plan. Grace taught my wandering feet to tread the heavenly road and new supplies each hour I meet while pressing on to God. Grace all the work shall crown through everlasting days. It lays in heaven the topmost stone and well deserves the praise. Well, that's a great hymn, isn't it? And we need more hymns, I think, on this amazing theme of grace. But probably the one hymn that's best known is the hymn Amazing Grace by John Newton. A hymn that was first sung in the village where he was uh, the minister in Olney 250 years ago this year. In the 20th century, you know, the hymn Amazing Grace has been adopted by all sorts of people, not least of which civil rights groups. They see it as a kind of anthem about their struggle for equality, maybe in the area of racism or something like that. It's a hymn that's become a real rallying point for many people who are not Christians. But the hymn is actually written about our struggles, not in terms of the... Uh, political and civil issues of the day, but our struggle with sin, and more importantly, God's work in us and for us. That great hymn, Amazing Grace, it has those wonderful words, but it also includes this, I once was lost, and now I'm found, was blind, and now I see. Speaking of the transforming power of God's grace, in our lives, all about God's work in the life of the sinner. Well, as you probably are aware, I'm sure most of us are, even the lads here on the front row, probably you know this, that the person who wrote that hymn was a very interesting man. His name was John, John Newton. And he knew this experience of God changing him as a sinner and bringing him to a place of grace. And he knew it in a very dramatic way. You see, John Newton's dad, well, he was um, 
he was a bit of a character, shall we say. I'll say a little bit more about him in a minute. But John Newton's mum was a lovely, lovely Christian. And she loved John and she cared for him ever so much. She taught him the Bible. But sadly, she died when John was just six years old. And that meant now it was up to his father to bring him up. I said he was an interesting man. Well, he was a sailor. And he pushed John in the direction of a career in sailing. And because this happened a long time ago, well over 250 years ago, he was sent to serve on a ship at sea when he was only 11 years old. Imagine that, eh? It's very, very tough. Sadly, he followed the ways of sailors, particularly in those days. He speaks about having my awful mad career at sea, is how he described it. He experienced many of the cruelties of life at sea, and even at times he felt so miserable himself with the life he was living. Uh, he, he felt very, very depressed. It's said that sometimes sailors uh, were nervous about sailing with him, because one of the things he used to do, his heart was hard to God, but he did know a lot about the Bible. So sometimes he would do parodies on Bible stories, which was so obviously and evidently blasphemous. And some of the other sailors would refer to him as Jonah, believing that one day God would deal with him and uh, punish him. Well, we know that he got into the terrible slave trade, and he would refer to himself later on in life as being the African blasphemer in reference to how he was before he became a Christian. But one night there was a terrible storm, much, much worse than this storm tonight. And it was off the coast of Northern Ireland. And uh, while he was there in the storm, it looked as if the ship was going to go down. And he called out to God for mercy. And he writes that in that moment in the storm, when he asked God for mercy, it was as if the storm took his words and threw them back at him and accused him of being a complete hypocrite before God. He took to his bunk and eventually with a long struggle, this terrible sinner who dealt and whose career was built on great, great wickedness, he came to a knowledge of God's mercy and forgiveness and love. And so he was the one who wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace. And when he says, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, well, he really, really meant that. And grace remained the big mark of John Newton's life for the rest of his life. In fact, we're told that when he was an elderly man, there was a young minister who actually went on to have a great uh, influence on the city of Bath, a man called William J. He met John Newton as an old man. And Newton spoke to him and he said this, my memory is nearly gone. It's what happens sometimes to some people when they get to be elderly. My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great saviour. I think they're the best things to remember in life. They're the most important things anyway. Well, he wrote that hymn, and certainly this is a passage that John Newton would have rejoiced in. Here in this passage, we are shown again that all God offers us as sinners is on the basis of his grace. We cannot take a step towards God in any meaningful way without his grace working in our lives. Now, Paul has a great deal to say in this letter about grace. Before we really look at chapter 2, he says some wonderful things in the first chapter about grace. So he tells us there in verse 3 that as a result of God's grace in the life of the Christian, we have been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. As a reminder for you and me tonight that if we're Christians, this is what we have. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Well, as Paul writes there, he speaks there in verse 3 of chapter 1 of God blessing us in the heavenly realms. And we might ask tonight, who is he referring to? Well, clearly he's referring to the Christians. 
in that city of Ephesus who were reading this for the first time. Clearly he's referring to Christians everywhere who would read this. But we need to remember tonight that Paul includes himself in this. And like John Newton, Paul writes in another letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, reminding us that before he was a Christian, he says, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. That's what I was like. I hated Jesus Christ, effectively, and Christians. And he's writing to people in Ephesus who, when he first met them, would have included Christians who were resisting Paul's message and on one day, occasion tried to shout him down with a big crowd who said, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And Artemis was one of the pagan gods. So isn't it amazing? Here is Paul, a man who once by his own testimony was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, writing to people who once were passionate about a pagan god. And there in the first chapter, in verse 3, speaking about now how God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This is a wonderful reminder, isn't it? That God delights in his grace to change us, to transform us, to bring us from darkness to light, from death to life. He delights to take hopeless cases people who we think would never become a Christian or, or people who maybe are really hard or just terribly, terribly indifferent to God. God delights to work and to bring them and to bring us to faith in him. Well, what are the blessings that Paul speaks of there in chapter 1? He says, well, it's every spiritual blessing in Christ. What are these blessings? Well, he, he expands on it in the first chapter. He says that God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. Isn't that amazing? You look up in the night sky, sometimes you see it's clear, and you see the stars, and you realize, you, we're told these are so many light years away, and you look at the complexity of it all, and you can look at those stars and say to yourself, ever before you were there, God knew me, and he chose me, in his son but he chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight his desire is to change us to transform us and you might say in what way does god do that in the christian what way did he change paul what way did he change the ephesian believers what way did he change john newton and you might even be saying tonight to yourself well if i was to become a christian how would he change me the way in which he changes us is he causes us to become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. So that we're less like our old sinful selves and more and more like Christ. And this is all a result of God's love, wonderful love. He chose us in Christ before the creation of the world. In love, Paul writes in the fifth verse, he predestined us. So God's work is to do us good, cause us to be holy and blameless, to come into his family, as he says in verse 5 of chapter 1, to be adopted as his sons. And you might say, well, how is that possible? It's very easy, isn't it, to hear the story of John Newton and say, how can an evil, blaspheming slave trader ever be changed in that way? Well, you might even look at your own heart and your own life. And you might say, well, I just seem to be somebody who's a bit of a hopeless case. How can someone like me ever be changed and transformed? Well, clearly something needed to be done to John Newton and to Paul with his persecution of Christians. And maybe clearly something needs to be done to you as well. And you might find yourself wondering, well, well, what is that? And how does it take place? But Paul answers these questions again in the first chapter. In verse 7, he speaks about Jesus and he says, In him we have redemption through his blood. Now, redemption means that we have been bought back. As it were, sin that kind of 
taken us away from God and, and Christ has brought us back from the dark paths of sin. But it came at a great cost. It happened through his blood. Of course, that's a reference to the cross. How is it made possible that a man like John Newton, a man like Paul, a man like me, a person like you, can be transformed and brought to a place of being adopted into the family of God? Well, it's all made possible through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. There we receive, as he also says in verse 7, the forgiveness of sins. That's the great thing, isn't it? I often wonder with John Newton, maybe there were times when he struggled with painful memories and a troubled conscience. But how perhaps in those moments he would have run to this letter and reminded himself of what God has done. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So the big thing Paul is really laying down in the first chapter is that all of this wonderful work is God's work. It's God's work in us. It wasn't that one day Paul rolled out of bed and decided that he wanted to take Jesus Christ seriously, and it wasn't one day that John Newton decided to do that. And it's never the case with any Christian anywhere that suddenly, by our own efforts and our own ingenuity and our own thinking, as it were, we turn to God. No, God has to begin the work in us. He initiates it, he makes it possible, and he does it for us in his Son. And then wonderfully, he offers it to us freely through faith. Which brings us now to this chapter chapter 2 and just these short verses verses 1 to 10 and again here Paul wants us to know that the great work of grace in the life of the Christian is all God's work in verse 8 we read for it is by grace you have been saved through faith not through your own strength not through your own abilities not even through the prayers maybe of your parents or of a husband or of a wife or of a friend you've not been brought to this place have been saved through faith as a result even of coming to church regularly. But instead, it's all a result of God. God working in your life, and in particular, by grace. In verse 10, he refers to us as being God's workmanship. You can look at a Christian. Remember, uh, years ago... Um, had the privilege of taking a meeting in, a, in Aberystwyth University and I'd never been there before and hadn't really spoken in universities. I was quite nervous and uh, I went there and I sat on the front row and uh, there was an Asian lad sat next to me and I got chatting to him and I said, uh, do you come here to the Christian Union every week? No, he said, never been before. But I, I'm a Muslim but I've come here tonight because there's a lad on my course who's a Christian and I'm impressed by his life. So I've come here to find out about Christianity. Quite extraordinary, isn't it? I don't know what happened to that chap, uh, whether he's come to faith, but that is a remarkable thing, isn't it? But we are God's workmanship. What made that young man the way he was? It wasn't that young man, but it was God working in him and through him. We're God's workmanship. Well, grace is the word then that is used for all that God has done in the life of the Christian. It tells us there in verses 8 and 9 that what we have received is not from ourselves. Instead, it is the gift of God and not by works so that no one can boast. I think the more you go on as a Christian, the more mature, maturity is worked within us by God's Spirit, the clearer this becomes, that all that I am depends on Christ and on his wonderful works. But at the same time, chapter 2 is showing us that the Christian, though saved by God's grace, is not passive. Look there in verse 8, we're told that it is by grace you have been saved through faith. So it's not a question of us just sitting there and waiting, as it were, for one day God's grace hopefully to affect our lives. No, we are called to faith. You might say, faith in what? Well, it's very obvious in terms of all that the gospel has to say that it is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in what he has done and faith 
in his death and in his resurrection. I think that first part is sometimes overlooked by us. It is faith in all that Jesus Christ has done. Do you ever despair of your life? I was talking to a man last week, an older Christian man, had been a Christian for many, many years, and he was telling me about how he'd been reading a book recently, and it had spoken to him very, very powerfully. He said, there are times when I think of the terrible things I did when I was a teenager. I think sometimes of the times when things weren't good in my marriage. I wasn't good with my children. And things that I really, really regret. And maybe as you go on as a Christian, you have those moments and they trouble you. You can't turn back the clock. You can't smooth it out. You can't make it all right. Maybe people you hurt and upset and those, those people are no longer here. And you're just left with that sense of shame and guilt. But he said, I, I've come to realize afresh that my confidence isn't in my life, but it's in Jesus' life. And the Bible tells us he was tempted in every way that we are, but yet he was without sin. And so this is why the Christian is confident, isn't it? That when we stand before God in his holy justice, as one day we must all stand, we will stand there faultless, pure and clean, unrecognizable in terms of how we see ourselves, but perfectly recognizable when compared to Jesus Christ it's his life that is our confidence and Paul is telling us here that that we come into this through faith and chapter 2 goes on to show us that that everything God has done for us was undeserved by us it begins in those opening verses by showing us just how dreadfully serious our situation is if we are not a Christian or how it was before we became a Christian. In verse 1, he tells us that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. I had a very powerful experience this last week. An elderly lady in our church, who was a Christian, was taken very unwell, and uh, she was put on life support. And I was called into the hospital because, very sadly, there was nothing more they could do. And it came to a point where the decision was made to withdraw the support. And I waited in that little cubicle in intensive care with, the, with her daughter and her grandson who'd flown in from another country and were feeling very sad and very lonely. And I watched the process in all reality of death. It's a dreadful thing, isn't it? And eventually there came that moment where the monitors... And all the figures and the numbers on the monitors all read zero and she had died what struck me in that moment as I looked at her lying there in the bed how very obvious it was that she was not there something had really gone it was more than just that the heart was no longer beating and the brain was no something of her had gone and it was final and the body is left and it is unresponsive. And Paul uses that illustration of being dead as an illustration of what it means to be outside of Christ. And we need to get a hold of this because often we can have many ideas about God. We can read books, we can have discussions, we can talk, we can reason, we can argue about things of faith. We can seem to be really, really interesting and our minds can be full of religious ideas and theological ideas and even biblical ideas. But if we've not come to that point of faith in Jesus, spiritually, we are stone cold dead. And because of that, he tells us in verse 2, we follow the ways of this world. And in verse 3, he makes one of the most dreadful statements we read in this letter. He tells us that we are by nature objects of wrath. So Paul goes out of his way in the first three verses to really show us how desperately we need God to work in our, in our lives if we will come to faith in him. Which is why when you come to verse 4, we have these wonderful, wonderful words. But because of his great love for us, 
God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Those are stunning words. God's response to the fact that we've broken his laws, we've turned our backs upon him, we've put our fingers in our ears, we've gone our own way, we've done our own thing, we're not interested in him, sometimes we've said terrible things about him, we've certainly not acknowledged him as God, and there we are in that position, with no spiritual life at all, and there verse 4 tells us, but because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ that's what's happened to a Christian they've been made alive with Christ they've received spiritual life but the great thing Paul wants us to see in verse 4 is that what drives this is the great love of God for us as sinners and he is rich in mercy. God is not tight or stingy with his mercy. But he lavishes his love upon us. All of these wonderful things remind us of what God has done for us. The expression of that, the richness of his mercy and the depths of his love is, yes, he made us alive with Christ. How did that happen? Well, we heard about who Jesus Christ is. It might have been in a Sunday school lesson. It might have been from our parents. It might have been in a church service. It might have been with a friend in a coffee shop or something. And as we hear of who Jesus Christ is, that he is the pure, unspotted Lamb of God, and he's offering you his perfect life for your filthy, dirty life. And he went to the cross so that all of our sins could be blotted out. As we listen to that message and we hear it, and we listen to that friend speaking to us, something took place deep within us. He made us alive. Why? Because by his grace, we believed in that message. We may not have understood it fully, but we understood that we were sinful and we understood that Jesus Christ was sinless and that on the cross he had made it possible for us to be forgiven. And we put our faith as weak and as trembling as it is in him. Sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, I wish, I'm worried, you know, Phil, my, my faith is not strong. Sometimes I feel my faith is so very, very weak towards Jesus Christ. But you know one of the wonderful things our Lord said? That if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, that's all it needs to be. You can say to this mountain, be thrown into the sea. You see, the big thing is not the, the strength of our faith, but it's what our faith is in. The object of our faith. And just in those words of our Lord, he's saying, though our faith may be weak and faltering, and sometimes we may have great doubts and fears and life can complicate us, but the object of our faith is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ. And it becomes a powerful and a transformative thing. And that's why repeatedly the Christian gospel never ever calls us to trust in ourselves. Many things in life you do have to trust yourself for. Your judgment when you're driving a car, that you've done your homework, you're going to get your sums right. You have to trust yourself. You have to back yourself on those occasions. But when it comes to knowing God, dear me, we must never, ever, ever back ourselves and trust ourselves. Instead, we must trust Jesus Christ and back him as it were. One of the wonderful things Paul writes about in another letter, great letter that he wrote to the church at Rome and in the fifth chapter, he speaks again of God's love for us. God demonstrated his love for us in this. You know what a demonstration is. You know, you can hear somebody waxing lyrical about some skill that they've got. You know, I can do 300 keepy uppies or something like that. And so you say to yourself, well, come on, show me 50, because you don't really believe them. You want to see proof. You want to see evidence. It's like that with God, isn't it? We can say, well, God loves you. And you might be saying, 
How do I know? Look at my life. It's a mess. Everything's going wrong. You might say tonight, I've lost my job, a relationship's gone south, or my health is playing up. How dare you tell me God loves me? But God has demonstrated the proof that he loves us in one very particular way. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were rebelling, while John Newton was engaged in the evil slave trade, Christ died for him. And it's the same of you as a Christian. While you were rebelling, while you were turning away from God, there was a time when Christ died for you. And he purposed to have you and to draw you to himself. And that purpose was laid down ever before there was an atom in existence in the creation of the world. You need to remember tonight that if you're a Christian, what you have received from God is not a small thing. We live in a world that does that, doesn't it? You go to work tomorrow or you bump into one of your friends and they say, what did you do last night? You say, oh, I went to church. And they look at you with a kind of almost a degree of pity. What a daft thing to do. Always happens to me when I go to get my hair cut. They say, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a minister. Oh, dear. There's a slight look of compassion. I'm sorry for you. You should give your life to such a worthless pursuit. And it can be like that as a Christian in our world today. You say, I'm a Christian. Or, I went to church. I met with my Christian friends. And, oh, well, you don't want to be bothered with that. Far more interesting things in life. Far more fascinating things to be following. It's at times like that that we need this big view of what has happened to us. The fact that you're a Christian. The eternal living God purposed your salvation ever before the world was planned and made. And he made it possible through the death of his own son on the cross. And he's brought you to, your, to himself. You're his workmanship. And he is continuing to refine you and to build you more and more into the image and likeness of his son. And he's promised that one day, like that lady who I was with uh, this last week, that there will be a day when he will take you to be with himself, absolutely secure and certain. And it all rests on the wonderful grace and the wonderful love of God, a love from which the Christian, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, can never be separated from. Maybe you're going through a hard time as a Christian right now. Maybe you feel dry towards God. Maybe there's something going on in your life right now that you know is wrong and you're not really dealing with it. And you can be, find yourself thinking of how, how disappointed God must be in you. Indeed, you may even find yourself thinking that God must be terribly angry with you. Well, he is disappointed when we sin. He is angry with our sins. But nothing can separate you from his love. That is a powerful thing. Indeed, it's something that should shake you tonight if you are a Christian and cause you to wake up and thank God for that and to turn from your sinfulness afresh to Jesus Christ. Well, in all of this, I wonder as we conclude here tonight what your response is to this. If you are a Christian, if we really understand these things, of all that God has done for us in Jesus by his grace, I think really it should move us to do at least two things. The first is this. It should move us to worship. That's the response of the heart to the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not that we should sit around arguing and debating the finer points of what Paul is saying here, though there is a place for that, but if we, these truths really grip us and really grasp our souls, we will be moved to a place of saying thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your wonderful love. Thank you for your mercy. For by your grace you have saved a wretch like me. And from that worship into the second response should be a life of obedience. If all of this is true, if the almighty, eternal God purposed your salvation before the creation of the world, 
had made it possible by the death and resurrection of his own dear son. And he set his love upon you. And he has poured mercy and grace into your life. Well, it is our reasonable service to respond in obedience and to say, Lord, what do you want me to do for you now that you've brought me into your kingdom? For we are, as Paul writes here, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, this week he has good works for you to do, maybe in school, maybe in the home, maybe in work, wherever you are. He's purposed those works in advance for you to do them. And as you do them, you work out God's workmanship. But let's be enthusiastic this week to live for him and to serve him and to sacrifice for him. Not because we feel we ought to, but because it is the worship of our hearts in response to the news of his great love, his rich mercy and his wonderful grace.